So the network that I have for you today is a social network. It's a network based on family relations in a population of, in a model population of a mutually, mutually contemporary individuals. However, my talk is not a talk in reality, it is a, it's a video. So I invite you to see the video and then we can discuss if you have uh, questions. Hmm? From a modern perspective, the relevance of family ties and social phenomena may seem somehow marginal. But, on a second thought, we realize that kinship relations should be important in many respects and in many situations. Let us just make the following points. First, for most of us, family defines the primordial social context, especially regarding our cultural background. It is from that context and with that background that we jump into increasingly more complex social environments. Second, Structural anthropology identifies localized kinship patterns, which we would now call the motifs of kinship networks, as the building blocks of cooperative social behavior, such as social cohesion, alliance, and reciprocity. Third, many present and past social processes are clearly driven by family relations. An example that should be well known to all of us is that of pre-democratic Europe. Until the beginning of last century, European governments were essentially a family business, run by a handful of closely intermingled families that ruled over millions of people over hundreds of years, the self-appointed noble families. This is a map of Europe in 1914, at the beginning of the Great War. The dots show the seats of 24 monarchs of that time. And these connections show their kinship relations. The darker the line, the closer the relation. For instance, the kings of Norway and Denmark were brothers to each other. Lighter lines join first, second, and third cousins. George V, the British king, is said to have thought that a global conflict over Europe could not last for more than a few days, because they were essentially a big family. Sadly, he was wrong. But he was never known for his particularly brilliant mind. In any case, one of his first cousins was Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, at a certain point, they even became indistinguishable. George was also a first cousin of the last German Emperor, Wilhelm II, as they were both grandchildren of Queen Victoria. Now, as soon as you move away from these famous characters, it becomes more and more difficult to find reliable data on kinship in real populations. In practice it is still virtually impossible to get statistically significant data in the public domain to build a large kinship network, either for ancient or for modern families. This is why we'll study kinship networks on a model population, instead of attempting to work with real data. As you will see, the model is based on the European kinship system. We'll keep it as simple as possible, with the only condition to include both blood and in-law relations, always within a given generation. So, let us introduce the model. We consider a population formed by N men and N women. To define their sibling relations, we first assign exactly one man and one woman as children to a couple of the previous generation. In this way they become brother and sister. Of course, this is a very artificial children distribution. Our next step is then to reconnect each individual to a randomly chosen couple of the previous generation, with a fixed probability rho. For rho equal to zero, we keep the initial artificial distribution. For rho equal to one, we obtain a children distribution that has been used in many studies on genetics and genealogy. This procedure completely defines the blood sibling relations in our model population. Next, we establish an heterosexual monogamous marriages with partners chosen at random, but avoiding brother sister mating. This procedure determines the in-law relations. Once blood and in-law relations have been defined, we build the kinship network by first choosing one of the two genders. For instance, the men. 
Each man will be a node of the network. Then, we connect each man with his blood brothers and brothers-in-law. Just that. For the other gender, the network is statistically equivalent, so that it is not necessary to consider both at the same time. Summing up, our network represents intergenerational kinship within a single gender, and includes blood and in-law relations only to the first degree, that is, to the degree of siblings. The model has just two parameters, the number of men n, and the reconnection probability rho, that we have used to define blood sibling relations. Let us first have a look at a few examples of these networks, for n equal to 100. For rho equal to 0, the network is always a set of cycles. This may seem a little strange at first, but this happens simply because for rho equal to 0 each man has no blood brothers and exactly two brothers-in-law his wife's brother and his sister's husband. And the only possible network with exactly two connections per node is precisely a collection of cycles. For rho equal to 100th, some of the cycles have broken into filaments, filaments have stuck to other cycles, and some small cycles remain intact. As rho keeps growing, we find that cycles and filaments aggregate into a large component, but still there are some isolated small subnetworks around it. Finally, for rho equal to 1, we see that the large component has become more complex, and the small isolated subnetworks are still present. Our task now is to make a quantitative characterization of these structures. We'll study the following properties. Number and size of connected components. Recall that connected components are precisely the mutually isolated subnetworks that we have seen in the examples. The degree distribution, which is the distribution of the number of connections per node. Clustering, assortativity, and finally distances and diameters. We'll recall their definition later. The results correspond to several thousand numerical realizations of the networks for each value of n and rho. At the same time, for each realization, we have built a randomized version of the network with the same number of nodes and the same number of connections per node, but directing the connections at random. These randomized networks are a reference case to compare the results on kinship networks. In this first plot, we have the numerical estimation for the distribution of the number of connected components for three values of rho, and a population of 1,000 men. Full dots correspond to the kinship networks, and empty dots to the randomized versions. In the inset, we see the mean value and the standard deviation over the distributions, as functions of rho. The number of connected components grows with rho, showing that the networks become more fragmented. In kinship networks, it is always larger than for the randomized versions. This indicates that the level of cohesion of kinship networks is lower than expected by chance. Kinship networks appear to be more disaggregated than their random counterparts. This other plot shows the numerical estimation of the distribution of the size of connected components for 1,000 men and different values of rho. The size is simply given by the number of nodes in each component. The distribution is rather flat for rho equal to zero, but it becomes strongly bimodal when rho grows, with a steep rise for small sizes, and a sharp peak at around 860 nodes. This peak is the evidence of the formation of a big component, as we have seen in the examples. Here, we have similar results for rho equal to one, and several values of the population size n. Note that the horizontal axes are now normalized by n. The distribution of the number of components becomes sharper and sharper as the population grows, around a well-defined fraction of the size. The inset shows a close-up of the distribution of the size of connected components, at the peak corresponding to the big cluster. We see that the peak becomes better defined as n grows. This suggests that the big cluster is a genuine giant component, which contains 86% of the nodes. In fully random networks of the same size and the same total number of connections, the so-called erdos reni networks, the giant component has about 94% of the nodes. This is again an indication that kinship networks are less cohesive than their random counterparts. Let us now have a look at the degree distribution, that is, the distribution of the number of connections per node, k. For rho equal to zero, each node has exactly two connections. In that case, we have a delta-like distribution at k equal to 2. As rho grows, the distribution becomes wider, 
and exactly coincides with a Poisson distribution for rho equal to 1. These full lines show Poisson distributions for the same values of rho. Poisson is the expected degree distribution of an erdos reni network. But we have seen a moment ago that the kinship networks for rho equal to 1 are not erdos reni networks, since their giant components have different sizes. However, we find now that they happen to have the same degree distribution. Let us see what happens with clustering. Recall that clustering is a measure of the fraction of pairs of neighbors of a given node that are in turn mutual neighbors. Clustering can be defined in at least two ways. Global clustering is a count of the number of triangles all over the network. Mean clustering is an average over the nodes of the number of triangles containing each node. In the plot, you have numerical results for the two definitions as functions of rho. The error bars show the dispersion over the set of numerical realizations. Clustering is very small for rho close to zero, when the network is a collection of cycles. In fact, in any cycle with more than three nodes, it is exactly equal to zero. Clustering grows with rho, and reaches rather high levels. We see that there is a drastic difference with the clustering of the randomized versions of each network, which remains close to zero even for large rho. The main contribution to clustering in kinship networks comes from small groups of fully interconnected nodes. These are nothing but family groups of mutual blood brothers and brothers-in-law, who become more and more frequent as rho grows. As they are connected all to all, their contribution to clustering is large.